the Fabulous Fabaceae, aka the legume family. Pretty big, important family. Um, pretty important in agriculture because, you know, like peas and beans, and also um, wild plants. What um, distinguishes this family, the kind of direction they go in terms of departing from those primitive finch floral features, is the um, symmetry. These guys have striking bilateral symmetry. And they have a little bit of fusion um, in some of the petals, two of the petals actually. If you look carefully at these everlasting pea blossoms, they have a symmetry that instead of being upper and lower lip, like we see in the um, mint family, um, these have a symmetry that um, kind of more emphasizes the two left and right halves. This symmetry is sometimes called papillionaceous. It's sort of a, like a loose description. It means butterfly-like, and they kind of look butterfly-like. I kind of think of the flowers of the fabulous Fabaceae as being kind of like a boat with an insecure mariner. I will explain. The petals in the Fabaceae um, have names, and this, this, this one petal at the top that's really prominent, it's called the banner. Um, Sometimes it's called the standard, but I'll call it, uh, we'll call it the banner. I'm writing with my finger. And on the, there are two lateral petals, and they're called wings. Now, uh, the fact they're called wings kind of detracts from the nautical metaphor, but the banner reminds me of a sail, and the wings kind of remind me of oars. The reason this all comes to mind is because there's two more petals left. The number of petals in the Fab AC, which is kind of a typical dicot number, is five. So one banner, two uh, on the side called wings. There's two left, and they actually, um, they, they're sort of slightly fused together. They're fused together, they're tips, and they form what's called a keel. So this, this area right here, I'm sort of coloring in, that's called a keel. And that's where the boat thing comes in. I think of a boat with a keel, and I think of the sail as the banner, and the two things on the side are like oars. And weird boat, um, insecure mariner, two means for propulsion, better safe than sorry, and it's a metaphor anyway, so give the guy a break, or gal, whoever this mariner is. And the um, thing about the keel is that um, the keel, which is more well illustrated in this illustration here of another member of the Fabaceae called uh, a yellow wood. It's a tree um, showing the nice prominent banner and on the side the two wings and here's the keel again. What the keel does is it sort of sur slight, slightly surrounds the sexual parts of the flower. Um, not, not very much. Pollinators can still get in there. The, these petals, there are two of them there, they're fused at their tip. Let's take a closer look at um, this is a picture of the flowers of black locust. Black locust is a tree that's beginning to flower right now uh, along a lot of roadsides and um, some edges of natural areas. You'll see some trees that are like brilliantly um, white, big white puffy trees. And good chance these are black locust, Robinia pseudo acacia. And so here's a picture that shows the blossom. You know, here's the banner, our standard. And over here is the uh, one of the wings. And down in the bottom is actually two petals that are fused together at their tip that form the keel. Down below, um, I peeled off of the, the all those petals, and we see the sexual parts of the flower. And what we have is kind of an unusual configuration of stamens. It's sometimes referred to as nine plus one. Nine of the stamens are fused together by their anthers into like a little tube that surrounds the pistil which you might recall, it's a, this is the legume family. That's, this is the archetypal unicarpulate gynecium that matures into a legume that splits open along two sutures. It's kind of like a snow pea, right? And uh, nine plus one. one. There's one stamen that's kind of all by himself uh, that's not part of this little connivant little group. That's a typical arrangement for many members of the fabulous Fabaceae. Um, nine stamens fused together and one kind of a loner. And those are surrounding the pistil. Here's a picture of um, false white indigo, a lovely prairie wildflower that's um, being, um, being well fed upon nectar-wise by a bee. And you can see that this sort of situation or orients the bee in a particular configuration, which is apparently ideal for 
transferring pollen. On the left are the flowers of false white indigo, and on the right are the fruits. They don't look too super much like the legumes that we might have thought of so far, you know, that look like snow peas. Um, well, this is a cool little nature, natural history thing. Um, this plant, we're going to go back to it. This false indigo, it's kind of an uncommon plant. It's um, sort of a, a prairie wildflower with uh, an affinity to some endangered environments. It's not especially common in Ohio. Uh, butterflies and moths. This is a, a butterfly called the false indigo dusky wing. Butterflies and moths, they tend to be in some instances, uh, dependent upon particular food plants um, as sources of nutrition for the for the young, for caterpillars. In other words, caterpillars don't feed willy-nilly on any old plant, They and the females don't lay their eggs willy-nilly on any old plant, but particular plants that they're adapted to being able to eat. And this butterfly is the false indigo dusky wing, and its larvae feed on false indigo. Well, sort of, kind of. It turns out that the false indigo dusky wing also is able to feed on, fortunately for it, um, a weedy plant called crown vetch. So this is crown vetch. Um, you might have said this is a midsummer plant that's really, really common in um, uh, kind of barren soil. It's been planted a lot for uh, reclamation of, of barren lands and highway embankments. It's kind of weedy, not a whole lot of people's favorite. And Crown vetch, it turns out, is an alternate food source for the false indigo dusky wing. So if you see a false indigo dusky wing, it might not, uh, maybe you should call it a crown vetch dusky wing. I don't know. Here's a picture of a plant called partridge pea. It doesn't have that same symmetry as uh, most other members of the fabulous Fabaceae do, but it's fabulous Fabaceae nonetheless. It's an uh, annual plant, lives one year, um, sets fruit and then dies. That's a lovely native wildflower. Ah, this is beach pea. Beach pea is a plant that um, grows along beaches, and it's really common along the Atlantic coast and sparingly uh, inland along the Great Lakes. It grows on um, the few relatively undisturbed um, sand ecosystems that we have, including this one was taken at a state nature preserve in Lake County called Headland, Mentor Headland Dunes State Nature Preserve and this Latharis uh, palustris. I don't think it's palustra. I think it's draponica. And that might be a mistake. Um, well, this beach pea, nonetheless, is a lovely native wildflower. Oh, here's a poem about beach pea. I think I'll read it. Leave beauty to the rose and this lexicon of crimsons. O oh, ruby petal and holy thorn, poets, you can have it. You, beach pea, rooted in sand when all this land was lake when this lake was Atlantic coast, stranded when the glaciers calved and receded, leaving you and sea rocket, Cochili edentula, by the way, in the Brassicaceae, purple sand grass, ooh, Triplicis purpurea, that's nice, and spurge, ooh, ooh, seaside spurge, Euphorbia polygonifolia, nice plants, all of which you can see at Headlands Dune State Nature Preserve, but I digress. What genuine science, what skill in your flowering. You conjure nitrogen from thin air and hold it. That uh, refers to the fact that many members of the fabulous Fabaceae um, have nitrogen-fixing bacteria in nodules in their roots, and they're able to get nitrogen from the air and bring it into the ecosystem. It's called nitrogen fixation. It's not broken. It's just flying around, and fixation means to, um, to acquire it in a form that is available to other things. Hard as November wind in your roots, deep in the sterile loam, they spread and keep what water they can. Hard scrabble. This stretch of beach offers nothing but swells of dry turf. Break and wash of waves, like the back and forth of xylem and phloem. Ooh, vascular tissue. In your thin frame's tiny musculature. Pastel and crepe. Crepe? How do you say that? I don't know. Petal. Flower of work and metal. Ooh, nice rhyme. Spread out, spread deep. Bow to no one, to no rose. It's a little poem about beach pea, and here's the beach pea at the Headlands Dune State Nature Preserve. No, I thought maybe that this is the beach pea at the Headlands Dune State Nature Preserve. And here's the spurge, here's the sea rocket. Nice poem. Um, clovers. Clovers are um, um, example of uh, illustrate another feature of the fabulous Fabaceae, which is that many of them have compound leaves, and they also have very prominent stipules. Not super evident in this picture down there. The stipules. Reminiscent of the rose family. 
And um, in um, Ohio, nearly all of our clovers are introduced species. There are two species of really, really rare um, native clovers, Trifolium um, reflexum and Trifolium stoloniferum, um, none of which I have pictures of yet. White clover is a common one on uh, is a lawn weed, Trifolium album. And here's some plants that kind of look like clovers. Um, here's our one plant anyway, it's called black medic. And here's a, an actual clover in the genus Trifolium. And there's a little subtle difference in the, in the fruits. They're very short legumes, but um, black medic has the fruits without any covering and the clover has little coverings on the fruits when they're mature. Otherwise, they're very similar. This is a plant called bird's foot trefoil. It's got it's kind of a weedy plant. Boy, it's got a fancy genus name for such a weedy plant. Lotus, right? Um, this is not what you really think of when you think of lotus. And um, the inflorescence is an umbel, but the flowers are very recognizable. Fabulous Fabaceae flowers. You can see that big standard or banner. And you can see the, um, the wings. And beneath it is the keel. Um, the leaves are... Um, Actually, they're trifoliolate, but they have really prominent stipules. So they look like they're five foliolate, but those are stipules down at the base. This is called bird's foot. Um, and you might be wondering why it's called bird's foot. Why is it called bird's foot? Oh, in fruit, uh, those umbels, when they mature into these lovely legumes, um, kind of looks like a bird's foot. This is the aforementioned false white indigo at the Ohio State University Marion Campus Prairie, a nice re constructed prairie in uh, Marion County. And this is uh, another example of, no, it's not. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a rare, it's a rare butterfly that's nectaring on a, on a member of the uh, uh, fabulous Fabaceae. It's not, however, um, a specialist in it, um, but it's uh, a rare butterfly. This is a, a, a iconography that was made by a former student, uh, current um, friend of mine, who's uh, super, super into this uh, plant called running buffalo clover, that um, very rare native clover that can be found in some open glade-like areas in, in southern um, Ohio, especially Adams and Athens County. And I got to get down there the next couple days and see this plant. I've gone too long without seeing it. It's called Trifolium stoloniferum. And there's a little sketch made by, made by uh, Jonathan Kubesh. This is a lovely native member of the Fab ACE called Goat's Rue. And you can see the compound leaves and you can see the um, papillionaceous symmetry and the lovely standard and the wings. The fruits of the legume family are legumes. But there's some modification here. Now, this is a member of a genus called Desmodium. Desmodium, also generally called tick trefoil. These, this is an individual fruit, but um, when it's mature, it kind of breaks apart, you know, kind of reminiscent of a schizocarp. It breaks apart into one-seeded units that are flat. Maybe you've encountered this plant. It's really annoying. Um, what these do is they disperse as stick tights, and they stick tight to close. Here's a different species, and um, I annoyed the kid. No, I this might not have been my fault. She might have gotten these on her naturally. But these are the the loments. That's the name of this modified legume that breaks apart into units and sticks uh, uh, annoyingly to fur and clothes. Tick trefoil. So that's a kind of a modified legume. This is a, a genus called Melilotus, and it's um, sometimes planted for forage. Again, these le legumes are prized for being uh, amendments to soil because of their nitrogen fixing capacity and also that some of them are edible as forage like such as alfalfa um, they're planted a lot and encouraged on reclaiming waste ground they increase the fertility of the soil a lot of them grow in prairies because prairies actually have low soil nitrogen so this is white sweet clover and with a honeybee in the foreground so to summarize fabulous fab ace Unicarpula chinesium matures into a legume, lovely uh, papillionaceous symmetry, 
Uh, petals with special names, the standard, the wings, and the keel, which has a little kind of fusion at the tip. And here's a little iconography by Peterson, and it shows exactly that. It shows the big old standard slash banner, and it shows the wings. And if you look, look right at the bottom, you can convince yourself that he's showing us the keel. Fabesae. Fabesae. It's fabulous.